Helen, thank you for being here and doing this, and thank you for your beautiful exhibition. I think, uh, I mean, j just seeing it last night and seeing our piece again. So I'm, we'll try to do this as a studio visit. So when you are, if you're in Pasadena, you can see Helen will greet you coming out of the studio. These are just my photographs. <laughs> She'll tell you a story about early morning visits sometimes. <laughs> but um, uh, Helen, I have a pre-question from the audience. Everyone saw uh, Ren Weschler's fantastic, some of you saw Ren Weschler's beautiful talk, and it ended with you body surfing in the ocean. So everyone wants to know, how do you do it? And how, how do you have this life force? Um, so you can answer that through this talk about your life force and how you keep going. We did our exhibition at LACMA, your first museum, big solo museum project in LA in 2014. Uh, there's this exhibition now, which I guess would be mid-career. And then... I'm, sti I'm still in mid-career. Mid-career, that's right. We'll all agree this is the mid-career show, and then we'll move on from there. But I want to say also thank you to Lewis for making this all happen uh, at Site Santa Fe. You thanked everybody, but no one thanked you in that speech. So thank you, Lewis, for being back here and doing all of that. And I just have to say a shout out to my friends at the Lannan Foundation, at Lannan Foundation, where um, is like a second home to me here in New Mexico and spent many times. And thank you for your participation in this exhibition. Um, <clears throat> Helen, I want to talk today a little bit about like studio visit. These are my bad photographs of being in your studio inside. Uh, Ren alluded to the light of Los Angeles. Um, and you can read his essay, which you should, about the light of Los Angeles. But a lot of people who don't go to Los Angeles think of it as just bright light or light. And it's true, Hollywood moved, started in LA because of the bright light and film needed bright light. Uh, and so in LA. But when you talk about, uh, when he, he spoke about Vermeer, Dutch art, um, there's so much other light. You alluded, Ren, to smog which is one of the key factors of uh, Los Angeles holding light, which so many artists have talked to me about. Helen, you started, you talk about light, you started about looking into tide pools and looking down at water. Uh, so there are different kinds of light and, and the beautiful light painters like Vermeer painted in a place that where the light was different. It was cloudy a lot. And it actually is cloudy a lot in Los Angeles. I mean, people don't realize there are more, I'm a pilot, instrument flying condition days on the coast of Los Angeles than almost any city in the world. And so this foggy light. So um, since Ren drifted off, maybe we could start. You go to the studio and you're in bright light. You can see you were squinting coming out of your Pasadena studio um, as I arrive and come to your little parking lot, and then we go into these dimmer spaces to look inside, where you've held light inside. So maybe I could ask you a little bit about light in Los Angeles and in art to start. Okay. Um, it's What I think is very interesting about the light in Los Angeles, and I'm always asked about this, uh, California is the so-called golden state, the golden light of Los Angeles, on and on and on. I don't think it's light, golden at all. I think the real golden light you find in the Mediterranean and the, um, the south of France and all that, that truly is that rich, warm light. I think the light that we have, and certainly probably when you're flying, you, you notice it's a very cool, cold, more of a blue light. And we think of California because it's so warm, we think of the light and warmth being synonymous. Um, but I think the light is quite unique in Southern California, certainly different than in the clear, crisp light of San Francisco, for example. Or if you go further north, Seattle and, and the islands. Um, uh, I have a friend who lives on Lummi Island, which many of you may know, <clears throat> up in the San Juans. And the light up there is very, very much uh, uh, a bit like this. It's like champagne. It's very light. It's very dry. It's very even though it's surrounded by water. So there are all kinds of light. So what about the light in the work of the light and space artists is what you're really getting to. What have we or sort of codified or congealed into our works, which uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 60s when critics in New York loathed all of our work collectively and thought it was all the same, um, uh, although it was quite, there were quite a lot of nuanced differences. You can a speak lot. to that. So uh, I think the light uh, has affected all of us. Some of 
the original artists who were not interested in the life from the natural world that many of us were, like James Terrell and Robert Irwin. They were more interested in the light bouncing off of buildings. Uh, one reason in California light, I think, is, look, is so cold is there's so many white buildings, um, uh, coupled with so many cars that are so, have, like yours, 30 coats of lacquer on them. And so you have this brilliant light everywhere, bouncing everywhere, which is so wonderfully different than the light you look at outside, which is muted and, and soft. And um, I've always wanted to ask you, because you, of course, grew up in pa Pasadena and then went to the East Coast, to New York and to mm -hmm. Boston, and then in 63 or so Came moved on. back to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. How did it feel to come back in that sense, going away to this East Coast light and to this very different environment of even seasons and light to come back to L.A.? Was that important, to be gone and come back? Yes, because I think I saw it in a quite a different way. And I think I felt the light in a different way, in almost a visceral way. Um, I, I had never seen seasons, and actually I was, had never seen, you won't believe this, snowfall when I went to the East Coast. I actually came back because I got too cold after six or seven years and had to get back. But I think that um, there is a hold on California, uh, Californians who are natives. I've often been asked, there's three or four of the light and space artists like Peter Alexander and myself that were born there. And is there any difference between the light and space artists who were born there and others like Dwayne Valentine and so forth that came from somewhere else? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think there is something to it. Um, there's something in your bones about the light and, and, and the feel of Southern California. Um, anyway. Yeah. Well, there, it's funny because uh, I resist labels in art history so strongly that I don't even like when an exhibition is called that, although here's our book, Light, Space, Surface, which um, from LACMA. But it, it's complicated because it puts people in boxes. And it's mm -hmm. important to say that in Los Angeles, I mean, there's so many different traditions. Uh, the assemblage tradition of a kind of darkness of psychology and light is equally prevalent in Los Angeles as the light and space artists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always mm -hmm. comment on that. But on the other hand, there is something that held a lot of artists together in different ways who didn't know each other. I don't know if Ron Cooper's still here, Ron's who was here. working in LA hand, and making paintings that were translucent, that trapped light, light traps trapped light inside. Not so different, even though you weren't talking to each other or in each other's studio. So there's something about that time. I mean, one of the things about the time is technology or the presence of a lot of plastics. I mean, you were at Caltech. Um, and you were in touch with that and interested in that. And I know from, and from many different sides. So I talk to artists and they'll talk about, um, you know, like surfboards. That's a very influential practice because there's layers and layers and layers of color. That actually connects to uh, techniques of lacquer that come from the East because there's such an immense uh, influence from Asia into the space of Los Angeles and, of course, automobiles. You can, in Wren's book about um, uh, Robert Irwin, he talks about the, the paint of automobiles and the practice of restoring automobiles. And that's all part of this same thing. So there, there is something about it, right? And it's, it, but it's also, I think what's hard when people try to lump it all together as a group of artists is that they're, they're all completely different. When I, I really got to know you at the encouragement of James Terrell, a friend of yours who, you know, you were from the same place. And he said, if you're moving to Los Angeles, you know, look up Helen. Her work's amazing. Uh, I knew it from books. I hadn't really seen it. And so that I did. Um, I know you're friends, but your work to me is almost opposite because James is finding ways to take the immaterial of light and somehow make you think it's physical. And I didn't know what to think when I first walked into your studios, but part of what you do is use these physical, the physicalness, the plastics, the technology, and dematerialize it. It's almost a direct inversion somehow of what James does, although you both hold the light in these spaces. So um, it does seem like, and I'm sure you felt that at the time, that everybody was working on very different things. Yes, and uh, although a lot of the artists uh, lived and worked in Venice, I did not, although I commuted to Venice every day for a few years working in the studio of the 
the technical artist, Jack Brogan, who was the kind of catalyst and, and uh, the focal point for a lot, of the, a lot of us working with materials that he helped us, and particularly Robert Irwin. So um, um, unlike the minimalists in New York, I think that, that those of us in California were much more spread out. And even the ones in Venice were, were rather more secretive rather than collaborative and worked quietly. Um, the technical thing is very interesting. Um, I was a resident artist at Caltech for a couple of years uh, on the theory that there would be this marvelous conversation between the, the scientists, particularly the engineers that worked in polymers when we were working with this very dangerous polyester resin. And um, it didn't happen. Uh, the head of the program turned out to be um, less than uh, collaborative, let's say. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but it was very, very interesting. Um, shall I tell the story about the seminar with the, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, <clears throat> For example, I got to know the head of the chemical engineering department quite well. And at one point, when I was making the small spheres, he said, Helen, I'd like you to come to, I have monthly uh, luncheon seminars. I have uh, lots of different uh, chemists and chemical engineers and physicists and people working in a jet propulsion lab that are doing um, work on the moon and so forth. And I gathered them all together. And we have a speaker. Would you be willing to come? Is kind of, it would be a very unusual speaker, you're not a scientist, and bring a few of those small uh, uh, spheres and some slides. So with the old, armed with the old 35 millimeter slides and a few spheres, I went, and there were about 30, 40 men gathered around a table. We had a very pleasant lunch, and then I was introduced by the um, uh, head of the chemical engineering department, and he said, this is what she's done, and he explained them, and they were all quite fascinated except for one man. And I could tell that he was very annoyed. He was extremely like this. He was very stiff. And um, the more I said about my process, because he w they wanted to know everything about the process, the more annoyed he became. And so I was getting very nervous, and it became a tense situation. And um, and I was explaining, I was doing, I was sort of trying to invent these molds that were very um, rough, and some of them I would get in the supermarket and cut them with the scissors and pour into them. It was all very experimental. And I explained that I would make, uh, start with a sphere, which I would pour into a, <clears throat> a cylinder with colors, and that would then be poured into a hemisphere. And at that point, this man that was very annoyed spoke up and he said, that's impossible. You cannot put a hard edge um, next to a rounded edge because it will always crack. So the head of the department said, yes, but you see, she's done it. And he said, well, I don't care what she says. It cannot be done. <laughs> and so um, I tried to explain all of the variables and all of the problems, the humidity problems and all of the things and um, that did not help at all. It made it worse. And so finally, he got so angry that he stood up and he said, it cannot be done. There is no way that it can be done. She couldn't have done it. And, 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 but there was the evidence. So he stood up and he walked out of the room and he slammed the door. And I then said to Dr. whoever it was, I've forgotten, I'm so terribly sorry. I've offended this man terribly. I don't know what I've done wrong. What? Please enlighten me. And he said, well, there's no way that you could have known this. But you have just demolished his entire doctoral thesis. <laughs> so that was the difference between a theoretical scientist and an artist. See? That's so true about your work that you continue to do. And of course, uh, you know, thinking about the, the 60s and that time of innovation, but you're doing it now. So you whispered in my ear the other day you were together about the new molds and what you're doing now at, at the labs. And I, I, I'm so amazed that you continue to push the edges of that with the same enthusiasm now. So there's 50 years and new things are possible that 
no one else is doing, right? Right, right. Tell us what the, tell us what to expect. Can you give us a preview no, of that, or is that secret? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you keep at it, you keep getting more excited and passionate about something. Because um, I work with lots of different kinds of people, including <clears throat> aerospace engineers. One of them may be here today, and I have a team of a number of people. Some of them have been here working on this show. Uh, without whom I could not exist. Because some of these works, some of these works that look weightless, like the one we call Big Peach, uh, is, is, a, is an object. It's not a projection. It's extremely heavy. It takes five men to lift it. It's very unwieldy. I can't look when they're putting it into a pedestal or taking it out. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to go even bigger. And, um, but I can't talk about that too much okay. right now. However, I just want to say, speaking of aerospace engineers, um, today's, well, at least I get it today, New, New Yorker has just come out, and Andrea Scott has written something about the show in New York, and she mentions that she works with aerospace engineers. So technology has been part of this, but of course towards an end, because you're using it, I mean, literally to make it disappear, in, in part. So your works, when, and, and so the, Book, Radius book, beautiful photographs that actually do give you a little bit of a sense of the color and the space. But for those of you who have been in the exhibition, the fact is you cannot photogra photograph that experience because it is, it is literally present. It's, uh, Ren talked about slowing things down, that it's about time. You, I, I think it's about time even before the lights change because your eyes and your point of view is always changing. And if Everyone who's been there knows that even by moving your eyes and looking away from the lens, this changes the lens uh, entirely. And then you can look backwards and forwards, I guess, like the Vermeer picture of, of her moving her head back and forth. But it, it, it's totally experiential. Um, and being in the studio, we, I've been there many times as you would change the light. And then you finally decided not too long ago, because lights could do this, to, to move the lights up and down mm -hmm. in your installations. So say something about that, because we used to look at it at different levels. Here, 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 what do you like best? And in the end, I think you really chose to try to find a way to let people see these works in different lights. Yes, and this is still a work in progress, but what I want to say about the duration that Ren spoke about is absolutely true. And I've heard <clears throat> both in New York last week and here uh, the, the, today and yesterday, a lot of people <clears throat> feel that they themselves change during this up and down process, this um, sort of wave of them going up and down that you see something and your brain tells you that yes, the same color will come back and you will see the same thing. However, two or three people have said that I feel I have changed during that duration. And so I'm a slightly different person and looking at it in a slightly different way. So it works back and forth. It works on the viewer and um, the viewer then sees something different and then it works on the viewer again a different way. Does that make any sense to you? It does. And <clears throat> and sitting in the studio or sitting in, of course, the pleasure of the studio is that you're there alone, um, or we're there alone, and there it's very, very quiet. Uh, but that experience of, of just getting into a zone is very much what the work's about, because it, it does keep changing. I know it's a fixed object, but um, as I'm breathing, it's changing. Uh, as my eyes are looking away, it's changing, and it's this continuous, it's elusive, and I think that's part of the magic of these works, is that you're always trying to grasp them, but since they're on the liminal edge of, 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 of like a hallucination, um, I think we feel ourselves, and I, I'm sure all of you here have had different experiences of these works in the museum, but it's a little bit of what you're after, right, with that... Um, you're such a deep emotional component. So you're using tech and working with these scientists, and of course you're in your studio with your full garb with face mask, and it looks like a aerospace lab itself. But while you're doing that, you're trying to feel, create something that has emotion in it. And I wonder if you think about that, or do you work towards this thing and then sit back and see it for yourself? Do you imbue those? colors? Do you pick them because you want to 
have something felt? You want us to feel something? Or do they just, do you get to look at them for the first time in a way when, when they're produced? I have ideas of certain colors that I have always wanted to work with and I do work with. And the last picture he showed of me surfing last year, uh, if you look just at the right side and you look at all of those colors, you'll see those being repeated over and over and over in the pictures in the book. So I think those are very uh, profound colors and I, I use them in many, many ways. There are very few dyes that are available to use. I'm using a urethane now. It's very dangerous material, but I'm extremely careful, I hope. <clears throat> and um, these, these, um, these colors mix in my mind almost before I think about it. Or I, I, I can't make any preliminary drawing, so what I have to do is think about a color, like the peach is a mixture of a number of colors that are uh, analogous to each other. Um, and then I make a small one sometimes, which is like a preliminary drawing. That then grows to a larger one, and then I try to scale it up. It's very, very difficult because I work flat, and there's no mathematical formula that you can work on. It doesn't work that way. And then when I look at it standing up, it looks totally different than it works when it's lying down. So oftentimes, they don't work at all, and it's frustrating. But um, I think if you keep going and go past that point of frustration, and many artists work the same way, then you come to a new plateau where you do achieve something. I was very interested in something you said last night with the peach one. You said, um, you looked at it for a long time and you said, the red in the center does come forward. And it is like breathing, and as Ren talked about, it is duration. And so there is the communication that for all of us becomes emotional. Not for me, I'm too worried about the technical issues most of the time, but everybody else. Um, well, yeah, everyone should come. I mean, we were in an opening last night, and so there are a lot of people. But I know one of the ideas behind keeping, keeping the show here so long, Lewis, was that people would have a chance to be by themselves at different hours of the day, coming again and again. Because the even each of the colors, and there, it's nice to see the three works, because you've used yellows in a certain way, the blue-greens that we were talking about in the ocean, and, and then this peach color. And they... I mean, for me, they animate themselves in different ways. As the light goes lower in that peach piece, it, it is like it comes a little bit toward you. The blue-greens can sometimes uh, fade back. The yellow is somewhere in the middle. The yellow is the most mysterious. I mean, artists all have, a lot of artists have emotions they associate with colors. I'm wondering if you use, it's kind of those three, you use the blue-green and the yellow a lot recently. Uh, do they have meanings for you? Do you use them with intention, those beautiful colors? I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't know where the, where the impetus for the particular color comes from at, at the particular time. But while we're talking about duration and light going up and down, can we go to your piece? Yes, that's what I wanted to okay. So I want to talk about, oh, by the way, these are er, this is an early work we own in LACMA's collection. Very tiny. That is a, um, yes, an amazing, that predates some of these other works that, uh, is just magnificently beautiful as an object. Okay, let's talk about the columns because so much time was spent developing that work of art uh, as an installation. I think you spent practically a decade, right? Thinking, making versions of it. I saw this, the shows you developed with single double columns. We own this one at LACMA too. And that led to the conversation about the bigger work, the more monumental work. Don't you love that blue dot? By the way, the blue dot, everybody's <laughs> talking. How many of you have seen the blue dot? In this piece? In this piece here. It's, it's the last column. Um, um, so I want to talk I about... I want to talk about the history of this. Okay. So right Michael here. had been in my studio, and he'd seen the colored ones. They'd been shown a few times. And then I went to him um, in 2012. It was one of the few very few rainy days in Southern California. There's no rain anymore there. And uh, I remember that I, I had an architectural drawing which I presented to you, not to particularly show at the museum, but I wanted your input on it. So you looked at it and you started jumping up and down. You said, no, we want to show it here, I want to show it here. And <clears throat> it was an interesting, I, I don't remember the origins of the idea, but it was one long line 
um, let me go on to get that one, of 12 eight foot high columns. And um, you immediately, after your first enthusiasm passed, you said, oh, well, there's no place we can possibly show it. We don't have a space that's 120 feet long. They have to be 10 feet apart. Um, and uh, you said, I think there's only one, maybe one museum in Milan or somewhere that has a space that long. I know all of the spaces, the museums, and we, there's no space. But finally, you figured out that you could knock a few rooms out. And we, 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 we <laughs> no small project. Yeah. The building had never <laughs> been opened from edge to edge. But I did measure the inside, and it was almost perfect. It was like 100 120 and, feet. Yeah. Well, the piece is 120. I think it was about 135 or something. Right. So anyway, that's, that was the origin in 2012. And um, so you can take it from there. Well. Well, we had seen, we'd been looking at these pieces, and you talked about this larger number of columns, and I guess we had a lot of discussion about how all of a sudden going from this object, which relates a little bit to things like this, an object that you can move around, that you can see inside. By the way, how many sculptures really have an interior, and an interior with color? Think about that. You have to really think hard about sculpture that has color on its inside. Just one of your many innovations, by the way. Anyway, so here you had these objects, and we went, we acquired this one, it's so beautiful. And, and it, there was a big change in my mind when you were thinking about doing something so large, because it does imply architecture. Mm -hmm. I had not, I, I go back and forth to Korea, and I know I was going on and on about some of the um, ancestral sh shrines where there were just rows and rows of columns, and I knew also that those buildings had influenced people like Donald Judd for what he did in Marfa. And interestingly, in John's essay in the book, he talks about your work in Judd, but that's another uh, digression. Um, but it is, and it's completely different here, obviously a different arrangement, but the, this idea of architecture, experience, and time, of course, gets played out in a whole different way because you are walking in and around many of them. And you were very clever in how you, um, you talked a lot about the arrangement of it, right? Because some were, are surprises. They look one way on one side, and they have a little glow coming through them, and then you have to walk around to the other. So it is a whole journey. This piece seems to, I don't know if you've ever done anything else quite like this, on this scale, or with that sense of the journey in time, not just the looking in time. No, but what's interesting is a slight digression or, or a, uh, affirmation of what you're saying about the journey. It's very interesting that kids between particularly the ages of 7 and 12 or 13 get it right away. Um, I was in there one day and there was a family of six children and their mother and they were came to the museum. They were very sophisticated. They came to the museum every Saturday and they saw this piece for the first time I was talking to them, and one of them was about the fourth column down, and she came up to me and she said, oh, Helen, Helen, I just discovered something. And I said, what was that? And she said, the secrets are hidden on the back side, <laughs> which is true. All the images are on, on one side. And it was very interesting. The other thing that children do easily and without any um, help from adults is that they know that when they see something like this, it's mysterious to them, they know how to bend down and crawl around and get up. And just when they think that something, um, uh, that they will discover something around the other side, it disappears. So they're continuously um, excited about it. Adults are more reticent, takes a little more time for them to, to get into it. But th there's something that interesting that I discovered about uh, yeah. the pieces. In, in, in this installation, too, and you see it here, I, I think everybody's felt that sense of the whole. I mean, it does look, it's kind of archaic, like this sense of columns of an ancient architecture, but of course it also looks almost Stanley Kubrick-esque in its modernity and futurism. And so there's so many emotions, uh, when I first saw it all put together, that were all bundled together. But the other aspect of it is to see this large arrangement that has a quality, linear quality here, it keeps that in different ways. And then you can look at them together as they form a group. Here you can see the two sides, there's the little dot in one of them. There you go. Um, and then, of course, people, 
end up looking closely at this miraculous light from within. This is one of my favorites. This, um, And again, these do seem to glow, but there's no actual light inside them, right? That's also uncanny. It feels like they must have a light inside them. The light is from above and from outside, but you've designed it to hold the light. And then you have these mysterious objects inside, and this one is copper, right? Yes. So you have real copper, yes. real, another yeah. real material that has a light presence. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We have, yeah. So tell me about, you showed me the drawing, and, and immediately we leapt to how do we get it done? That's what you wanted to do is build it. But you had already spent years coming to this. And I don't know if we ever really discussed the backstory of why you wanted to do this. How did you get to that drawing with, all, with the columns with this larger installation? Well, then we have to go back to the previous colored columns that were done before that. I can't actually get back, lost to my conscious memory right now, about how the columns became interested, interesting. I may have had a discussion with you, whether it was at the museum or my studio, when you were traveling all the time to um, the west of Korea, right, into some of these ancient towns. And you told me, um, I think for almost an hour, it was r really wonderful about some old villages, walled places you visited, where there were, you weren't particularly interested in the, uh, the temples. You were more interested in, in the palaces that were like muni municipal buildings, ancient. And some of them, if they had a, um, a city magistrate or somebody that was particularly popular when he died, they'd add more and more columns. These are so the shrines. The shrines. You would just keep adding to them. So weren't there hundreds of columns? There were hundreds of, there were, yes. I don't know if it's hundreds, but they just and kept getting longer and longer. Yes, and I think I remember that you asked uh, if a Westerner could ever participate or observe them, and they said no. Well, in a certain way, right? Yeah. But we can see them as architecture. Yes. But anyway, the columns, um, I was very interested in the ellipses. This is a double ellipse. Um, I've never been interested in, in a circle. The thing about the elliptical shape that is translucent is that whatever's inside it will contort and conform to wherever you are. So it's a, a dialogue of the eye, in a way, spying on something that is within an elliptical shape. As you walk around it, it tends to disappear. And I like that tension between the, both the eye and the brain, what the eye sees and what the eye thinks it sees. And um, I just thought of something I wanted to say. It doesn't have to do with this. But you know, there has, I've been doing a lot of reading about what people have thought about the visual world in this country. And there has always, have always been people who have been aware of perception and the, and the thing of looking. And, um, even I came up across a wonderful, very simple New England quote from Henry David Thoreau, who said a couple of hundred years ago in the early 1800s, he said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And I think that's so wonderful because it is a simple, as a New England person, but really the depth of seeing, and of course, it's the difference between observation and comprehension. All of that plays into this, but I think in my mind, and in the mind of most artists, it isn't a conscious thing. It's um, up in the mess that's up here and uh, swirling around, and it finds its form in some way. But there is a mis mystery even in the thinking process that goes into it. I think that is relevant. When I describe that you and your friend James Terrell's work are in use of light, I think of as opposite, this you material dematerializing material and him trying to make light into a material. But you both share this idea that there's a third element of the medium, which is perception, right? You, you light in this kind of color and how we feel the light of the disc is not actually there. Like we have to remember that it's not there. It's only there in our mind. <laughs> and you can tell by how it changes, how everything changes as the light changes that it, that it I don't know if it's a mystery, but it's definitely made by us uh, in collaboration with, what, with your prompting device that you've created for us. And I see you doing that all the time, smiling, when you would see me discover what happens when the light changes or when I would come in to see a new disc that um, was completely different. But that notion of the perception, and I know you, 
you can, I think one of the things about working as long as you have, you say you're just getting started, so we're looking forward to the next things, is that something that only comes from practice. That is, I think, hard to do as a, as a beginning artist, that one of the things about having been able to work for so long is you've been able to um, really work through this issue of perception by, by uh, experimentation, because again, you can't predict exactly how that lens is gonna look until you're finished and spent weeks making it, right? So, um, I don't know, do you feel that, that these years have given you this extrasensory uh, sense of, of how to play with perception just by the iterative process of making and looking and making and looking? I think this this sense of what you're getting to too is the issue of discipline. I think once an artist begins to discipline themselves to the actual process, the, the working process, it leads to the ideas in a strange way. The ideas then become part of a new process and it moves upward. There are also lots of dead times as there are for writers and everyone else when nothing is happening or working at all. And then I think you just have to leave it alone, let it go until you can begin again. But I think this dialogue with oneself goes on and on and on. And as I've said, you know, if you stick at it long enough, people begin to think that you really have something to say, whether you do or not. <laughs> well, I think you have answered that question of how do you keep your vibrancy of spirit and work alive through, through this long period of time? Because I, I know that sense that you have about being excited about every work that you make when you see it. It's almost like you can't see it until it's done. And that anticipation does seem to drive you. And it is a life force that I think uh, we actually feel when we see the work. So I think we have answered the big question, the pre-question. Are we gonna take questions? Is that the idea? We're gonna take a few questions. Are there questions in the uh, audience and those people who have seen the exhibition. Is that okay, Joanne, or, or is that we can't facilitate? Is that all right? Will that work? Okay, no, you can have mine because Helen's going to answer. No, no. Oh. <laughs> okay, so does anybody have any thoughts? Or there's one right here. I'm curious about your perceived failure rate in terms of <laughs> your you're working and working, and then how much of what you're doing seems to fail for you? Well, it's about one in uh, 10. One good one, 10, bad, 10 in the dumpster. That's pretty high. It still is that way. Uh, I'm getting a little better at it, um, but it is very, very difficult work. And um, I'm very, I think the, the longer you work, the, the harder you become on yourself. And it is very, uh, you know, I want them to look as they've been blown into being, but the, but the nuts and bolts behind it, it um, it's extraordinary, difficult. There may be 50 to 70 steps uh, physically, process-wise, involved in each of the lenses that you're seeing. You don't see any of them, but, um, but they're there. And if one of them goes wrong, then the piece is no good. Uh, unlike, uh, it's like watercolor, unlike oil painting, which you can scrape off and start again, there's no, there's none of that, and this is a total failure, and um, so, yeah, it, but it, it is exciting, it continually excites me more and more uh, about doing this, I have more ideas now, Michael, than I have ever had, and I'm working, um, for example, with a, a client in, um, in Athens, uh, about maybe a very large project that involves a number of light and space artists. And it's tremendously exciting. It's incomplete, and I can't discuss it, but it is very, very exciting. And I think these things lead an artist further and for further because you're working in the present, but you're thinking towards the future. That, again, changes your aesthetic um, vision, and the vision grows, alters, and changes, and you change with it. And I think that's where the enthusiasm and the excitement, for me, comes from. And uh, my question is about the, um, the light itself. When you're envisioning your works, do you consider the, the deeper nature of light or down to the, the, the realm of the photon or the pathway that light takes um, in terms of its own personality or its own, its own life? I don't think I do. 
I, I don't think I do. I'm not sure. I, but I, not in my conscious mind, anyway. I have a much more basic question, but I, I love hearing about your. Hear you. I love hearing about your practice, and I'm I'm kind of curious. Is there? Do you know what? Because your work is so ethereal in a way. And do you know in your mind what it's going to look like before you start working on it? And this sense of like, or do, or does it sort of get to the end and then and then is there a discovery involved? Like it, it feels so deliberate and yet you can't see it as it's as it's being made. I have an idea in mind, and I hope that I achieve it. Often I don't. Um, sometimes I discover something new, and that's that's marvelous. But uh, can I visualize it and actually make it come to be? Um, I'm getting better at it. Let's just put it like that. Uh, so, so this has been alluded to both by Lawrence Weschler and a little bit in your conversation. I wonder if you can speak a little more to your, your historical sense of context, you know, being trained as an art historian, and how that may have influenced you know, some of the aesthetic cogitation that you have as you're s trying to solve these hard technical problems? One of the things about studying art history for so long is that I, f I realized I tended to, no matter what age I was studying, I tended to gravitate to um, works that were very... I can't think of another word, delicate, in that they were ha had either washes over them or they were uh, some sort of ethereal uh, movement. Um, I can't even, it's hard to even get to it in words. But I think that this idea of translucency and transparency and light always attracted me deeply. At the same time, I was becoming very disciplined in ri writing papers and delivering them as an art historian. And so I think when I somehow began to transition to doing it myself, the very first thing that I was interested in were, uh, were ceramic glazes that were put on, on clay. I've never worked with clay very much. I've never been interested in it particularly. But the glazes and glazes over glazes, when I began to paint with oil paints, uh, I used very thin glazes. And that led then to the discovery of these resins that uh, somehow all of us discovered at one time in the light and space group, most of us. And then one thing led to another, and it became three-dimensional. And um, yeah, I mean, one it's, yeah. it's true in art history that it's been a pursuit forever. I mean, Vermeer was a case in point that was raised earlier this morning. And it is, it's not just the depiction of light, but also how those canvases are are layered and made. And oil paints are naturally supposed to be translucent. That's the whole idea that they're held in an oiled medium. And we always talk about paintings that, um, so I think of it like we, in art history, you'll talk about paintings that seem to glow. Uh, and, and it seems like you just dispense with all that and just actually make these things glow. Instead of going through all the depiction steps of it glowing, you just figured you'd make something that glows. And of course, uh, those materials were all invented, most of them in Southern California at that time. And it seems so natural that artists would leap to that, um, maybe not as much for its newness, for its newness, but also for its uh, tradition. That there's a tradition in art history of looking for that and making light in in different ways. Um, uh, and so I do feel like maybe your study of art history made it so obvious that you could just take it two steps further than Perhaps. all those painters. <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, James Terrell is often and getting back to what Rand said this morning about the light and the light coming through the window in Vermeer. James Terrell has always said he was always interested in the light projection, the light yeah. projection itself, the light, not the slide, right. not the projector, but the light projection of the slide in space with all the dust floating in it and so forth. And I think it's that, that ingredient of light that uh, the California artists were working towards. They couldn't articulate it. I mean, I'm doing a pretty bad job right now, but uh, they, it was there. It was always there, and that's what I'm interested in too. What are the intangible things of light and warmth uh, which we rely on 
from the sun and so forth. What, are the, what is it about light that is so compelling to all of us, whether we're consciously aware of it or not? And I think this, whether artists thought about it consciously uh, and tried to depict it or whether it just appeared in their work um, un, unbidden, um, is a basis for some of the connection of the light, early light and space yeah. work, don't you? Yeah, and I think, again, in L.A., it's the multiplicity of lights. Uh, we talked about, uh, Ren talked about the stars that aren't twinkling because there's a clear night. There's the light in the water we discussed. There's, a, there's the way the smog holds light. Uh, there's the bright light, and there's the light of the desert and the ocean reflecting it. And then, as you're pointing out, both for you and James Terrell and others, there's the light inside of movie projectors, which was very prominent in California also, this and, light inside. And speaking of movie projectors, I have to tell you about my experience with Michael. Speaking of movies, the movie world, which is always very glamorous to those who aren't a part of it. And <laughs> uh, one of the first times that Michael came to my studio, um, I've been trying to get him there for 16 months. Aaron Wright uh, finally made it happen. And uh, he pulled up in his car, which had, I'm not kidding, kidding you, the 30 coats of lacquer. Jack Brogan helped paint it. Jack Brogan helped with that. And, of course, uh, painters like, uh, 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 artists like uh, John Bob, McCracken have been... It was a just, Bob Irwin paint, actually. It was a Bob Irwin paint. <laughs> anyway, it was a gleaming uh, car, a warm day that... The top was down, and Michael was. I think you weren't in your in your tie, but but you had your suit on, of course, and and you and your you know your hair was blowing, and you came in. I was standing out in the alley talking to some of the other people, and he came speeding, and he knew where to park, and he came speeding down the alley and stopped, and uh, these two gentlemen I was talking to in the alley said, "Oh my God, is that a movie star?" <laughs> and I said, "In a way, yes." Maybe that's a good place to stop. Thank you, Helen.